everyone, welcome back to our YouTube channel, JYF Museums. My name is Alexis and I'm one of the group educators here. And today I wanna to talk to you about some of the problems the early English colonists faced, specifically problems related to the James River. What I love about history is when you study history, you also study things like literature and science. So today I wanna to talk to you about the science of the James as it relates to salinity, turbidity, and flocculation. Let's go ahead and get started down at the end of the pier. We're here in front of our recreated ships to talk a little bit about why those English colonists chose this location to establish their fort. Before they even leave England, the Virginia Company provides them with a list of instructions. These instructions are going to tell them the best place that they can establish, th establish themselves here in Virginia. Now, this is a very long list. In fact, it's a multi-part video on our channel. So if you want to go into detail about it, I recommend hanging out with my friend Brian while he talks about it and his videos will be linked down below. But to summarize some of these reasons, this is a very defensible location. It's at a bend in the river, which means if the Spanish do decide to siege James Fort, it's going to be much easier for the English to defend them here on an island or peninsula. Another reason is the presence of fresh water in the springtime. When they first arrive here, the water is fresh. There's not any salt, not very brackish, and so they believe that this is a great place to establish themselves for water. In addition to that, Due to the depth of the water here in the river, they're able to bring the ships very, very close to land, which makes it much easier to unload. All these are reasons they establish themselves here, but some of these reasons don't hold true as it rolls into summer and to fall, namely the presence of fresh water. Now let's get down to the brass tacks about why we're talking about the river today and talking about science with the river. Now, when the English colonists first arrived in 1607, there's 104 men and boys who land here. Now, by the fall, around September, they're down to only 38 people, and the science that we can look at can explain the high death toll that they're facing. In early June, George Percy, who's over here, uh, writes about the river, and he says, The 13th day we came to our seating place in Paspahes County. This river which we have discovered is one of the famousest rivers that was ever found by any Christian. Wheresoever we landed upon this river, we saw the goodliest woods. There were also many fruits, great plenty of fish of all kinds. As for sturgeon, all the world cannot be compared to it. In this country, I have seen many great and large meadows having excellent good pasture for any cattle. We had also sown most of our corn on two mountains. It sprang a man's height from the ground. This country is a fruitful soil. So looking at these early months, it seems like everything's going great for those English settlers. After Christopher Newport departs back to England, it's very quick that the death rate starts to climb. By the end of the year, George Percy is going to have very different things to say about the river. He says, Our men were destroyed with cruel diseases as swellings, fluxes, burning fevers, and by wars, and some departed suddenly. But for the most part, they died of mere famine. There were never Englishmen left in a foreign country in such misery as we were in this newly discovered Virginia. Our food was but a small can of barley sod and water to five men a day. Our drink cold water taken out of the river, which was at a flood, very salt, and a low tide full of slime and filth, which was the destruction of many of our men. From Percy's account, we can see that things changed very quickly for them. Not only is there a problem with food over here, but also with water. He talks about how salty the water is, but also how to low tide it was very filthy. And I wanna explain the science behind that next. The first aspect of the river that I wanna talk about is the salinity. Now, salinity describes the salt content in the water and it's measured in parts per thousand. So parts of salt per thousand parts of water, essentially. Now it can be measured with a device called a refractometer and we'll take a look at that in a minute. But the English were pretty accurate in believing that it's salt water when they arrive in the spring. When they first get here, um, of course, snow melt has occurred, meaning fresh water is traveling down the James River from um, areas closer to the Appalachian Mountains and also heavy rainfall in the spring is going to mean that at least at the top of the river, it is fresh water, zero parts per thousand of salt. 
But as the summer rolls on, they're not only here in a massive drought, but the heat of Virginia, and if you're from Virginia, you know how it gets here, is going to cause evaporation of that top layer of water. And slowly but surely, as it moves into fall, it's going to be brackish water here in the river. Now, brackish water is essentially fresh water and salt water mixed together. And the brackish water is here in the river because the James River is actually a tidal estuary. This means that waters from the ocean and the Chesapeake Bay are flowing up the river while fresh water is flowing down the river. And they meet here right about at Jamestown. This area is called the Illigahaline. And if we take a look at this map, we can see we're right here in the center where they meet, where we have um, salt present in the water, especially in the late summer and the early fall. So Percy's right that the water can get very salty, especially in September. And this can contribute to some of the deaths they're seeing. Um, salt in the water can not only um, aid in dehydration in extreme temperatures, but also salt is a molecule that can connect to other things like bacteria and sediment. And we'll talk about that a little later when we talk about a fun thing called flocculation. Another aspect of the river that I want to talk about is Turbidity. Now, turbidity is another fun word, but it essentially describes how cloudy the water is. So how much the water is being churned up and the sediment makes it difficult to see. We can measure turbidity with the device I have here called a secchi disc. Now, the way that the secchi disc works is I'm going to take it, spin it, and lower it into the water. I have markings along the rope that will tell me how far the disc has lowered into the water. And I'm going to measure as far as I can see the disc still spinning. I'll then record this and it'll tell me essentially how churned up the water is, how clear it is and the visibility. Now turbidity can tell us a lot about all of the sediment that is in the water and that'll help us talk about flocculation which we're going to discuss next. Each orange line is five inches, so our measurement is 25 inches. Now that we've talked about the turbidity of the river, I wanna talk about flocculation, which kind of goes hand in hand with turbidity. So like I said, turbidity is how clear the water is, and it's clear based on essentially flocculation or things called colloids in the water. So colloids are any sort of material that's suspended. This can be organic or inorganic, so it could be dirt, sand, bacteria, um, other microorganisms and things like that. And essentially these are going to stay suspended in fresh water because the alignment is neutral. But as salt water is introduced, salt being an ionized molecule, it's going to disrupt the charge. So think about magnets being disrupted as more and more poles are introduced, positive and negative, unbalancing it. As the ionized salt comes into the mixture and disrupts it, the colloids are going to start to clump into flocks. Um, as they get heavy enough, they can fall to the bottom. And so what you often see with salt water, if you think about the ocean, is that it's pretty crystal clear. You can see very well in it. And that's because of the salt calling these, uh, causing these colloids to clump and to fall to the bottom. In freshwater areas, sometimes the water is murkier because we're not seeing this clumping going on. So turbidity can tell us a lot about salt in the water based on how clear how many of these colloids we can see suspended. Now that we've talked about salinity, turbidity, and flocculation, let's go ahead and measure the river today and see what's going on. It's the 4th of May, so happy Star Wars Day. And we're going to go ahead and take a water sample with our handy dandy um, coffee bucket here. And then we're gonna measure the temperature, we're gonna test the salinity, and the flocculation. Well, we have our water sample, I guess we'll Go ahead and give it a test. Bottoms up. Oh, George Percy was right, full of slime and filth. Oh, I'm kidding, that was my iced coffee from this morning. So now that we have our real sample of water here, um, we're gonna go ahead and give it a test and we'll do that separately so you can see a little bit better. So the first thing that I'm gonna test is the temperature since we just pulled it out of the river. So here I have a digital thermometer. We'll go ahead and get a reading here and we'll give it a couple seconds to uh, kind of balance out on the temperature. 
It's pretty cold today. It's dropping slowly but surely. Um, it stopped around 22 degrees Celsius, which is about 71, 70 degrees Fahrenheit um, for those of you who use that. So uh, pretty chilly today compared to the temperature outside. The next thing we can test is the salinity. And like I said, we can use a refractometer for that. So refractometers kind of look like fancy scientific kaleidoscopes. This is ours here. Um, you can find them online. They're actually not that expensive. So how refractometers work is what I'm going to do is I'm going to open to um, open the latch to reveal the pane. I'm gonna take a sample of water with the dropper and I'm gonna place it on the pane. Light is then going to refract through the water and reveal the parts per thousand of salinity, how we're measuring that there. Let's see, you have to look up at the light to get a reading and no surprise, uh, zero parts per thousand today. We're still pretty early in the spring and this is the same measurement we got last year, zero parts per thousand in May. Welcome now to the inside of our recreation of James Fort. Now, even separate from all the problems that those English colonists had with the river, Despite building a well in the fort, their situation is not going to improve. Not only is the runoff from the fort going straight into the river, this means any of the waste they're disposing in the fort or nearby the fort is going to end up right out in the river, but any wells that they dig in the fort are going to have the same water in the wells as the river since the fort is located so close to the banks. This means that the well water is going to be salty or brackish and also have that waste that they're disposing of. When 1609 hits, these problems are exacerbated with the colonists being trapped inside the fort, no way to dispose of their waste outside like they'd been instructed, and also no way for them to leave. This means that they're going to keep drinking that well water and keep getting more and more sick. After the starving times in the winter of 1609 to 1610, conditions are going to slowly start improving for those English colonists over here for a multitude of reasons. One being the increase and in regulation of steady supply ships coming from England to Virginia carrying things like small beer, which is much safer for those colonists to drink, but also due to the presence of women in the fort. In 1608, the first women arrive here, but there are only two of them. Over the years after 1608, there are going to be more and more women who start to come over, whether they be wives of some of the men over here or indentured servants. And a large group come in 1620. They bring with them skills from England, things like brewing, which allows them to make this small beer to keep people safer and healthier in Virginia. Thank you for joining me today on the pier down by the James River as we talk about how science can impact history, even if we're not looking at it till 400 years later. Hope you liked the video, and if you did, don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe below. Check out some of our other videos. We have a wide variety from cooking to weaponry here in James Fort. We have something for everyone, and have a good one. Of water and parts of salt. Oh my. Interrupting vultures. <laughs> okay. Salinity, am I right? The bird really wanted to learn. Okay. What are we talking about? We may have gotten that. No. <laughs> Hi, Baldy girl. Going fishing. And that top? Wow. What a, a wild one. Like. <laughs> Chrissy was right. What a plentiful land this is. <laughs> okay.